Hey, I'm Alex Rackle from Board Game Co. And today we are covering what games are leaving the collection in February 2021. If you're new to this channel, every single month I do a roundup of what is leaving the collection and why. And today we're going to start with the biggest of them all, which of course means it's the smallest of them all, which is going to be Tussie Mussie. Tussie Mussie is going to be a button shy game. I would argue that this is perhaps the third most famous, if that's the right word, after Sprawlopolis and Circle the Wagons, although I am likely projecting my own bias on it because it is my third favorite from those I've tried after Sprawlopolis and Circle the Wagons. And I debated keeping this one. Tussie Mussy is by Elizabeth Hargrave, desi designer of Wingspan, which, you know, was completely crazy famous. And Tussie Mussy is essentially an I pick, you choose kind of situation, although not only I pick, sorry, I split, you choose, but not even there really. You put down a bunch of cards every single round, then people choose which cards are going to take from face up or face down cards. And then you try to score based on how those cards combine in different ways. It's a solid game. It's pretty solid. And I made it keeping it except for one small problem. And that small problem is a game called Hanamakoji. Hanamakoji to me is a game that is so much better than Tassi Masi to myself, obviously, that I see no reason to, to play this. It's, I wanted to keep it just because of how small it is. I mean, it takes up no space on my shelf, but, but ultimately shelf space is not really my main problem. Headspace, mental energy, the decision to play one game over another or to play one game that I don't consider as good as another is just never worth it compared to the shelf space versus the cost versus anything else. And so Tussie Mussy is a game that is worth trying. Absolutely. I think it's a solid game. And for sure, if you like, if you like Hanama Koji, then I think you should definitely give it a shot because maybe for you, this one will be better. For me, Hanamakoji is the absolute best from small, portable, not as portable as this, granted. I mean, now making me think, maybe I should keep this for a travel game. I don't really travel enough to justify it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep it. But if you're looking for something for travel purposes, I think this is good enough that it's worth potentially holding on to. But otherwise, I, I just prefer Hanamakoji. And with that, let's just leave this nice and prominently displayed over there. With that, let's move my coffee because we have a game coming in from the other side. And that game is going to be Suburbia Collector's Edition. This bad boy over here. So, Suburbia Collector's Edition is a game that I got back because I kind of missed Suburbia. I got rid of Suburbia a long time ago. And I got Suburbia Collector's Edition back maybe towards the beginning of the pandemic, towards the beginning of COVID. And that's essentially because we had someone new who was, uh, you've seen her, you may have seen her in a video. She's going to be in more videos, but her name's Shira. And she's, she was in, she basically joined our household when everything started COVID wise. Cause she's a single person, didn't want to be completely alone. So we kind of self isolated or whatever you want to call it. And so as a result, she started playing a lot of games and I got back a lot of games that I had gotten rid of over the years that were, Gateway Plus, not necessarily Gateway, she was already a gamer, but Gateway Plus, so to speak, games that would give you a little bit more to experience with, or to play with, or whatever, or not. And so I put together a list, a long list of games that we have gone through over the past year, and some of them, meaning games that I loved, games that I once upon a time had, and I got them all back to, to play with them, to see if they were a fit now that we had someone new in the dynamic. And some of them have been played, and I think will stay for at least a while, Others have gone away again just as quickly or whatnot. And so Suburbia is a game by Ted Alsbach. This is going to be the prequel to Castle of Mad King Ludwig, so to speak. Uh, not prequel, but the, the original game where Castle of Mad King Ludwig iterated upon. And I always preferred Suburbia speaking for myself. I think Castle of Mad King Ludwig brings some better gameplay mechanisms to the table. But the ultimate puzzle of tile laying, the ultimate puzzle of fitting together your, you know, your city grid or whatnot, I much prefer in Suburbia compared to Castle of Mad King Ludwig. And so I got this back, and we played it a few times, and I like it, and I think it's great. And nobody asks to play it anymore, which is a typical problem and a common reason why I get rid of games. When a game is hits that shelf in a way that nobody is asking to play it, that it's a great game, we're all happy to play it, but no one's making that request, then it doesn't see table time. And so I specifically asked Shira, specifically herself, this past week of, do you like this game? And she said, yes. And I said, do you ever see yourself pulling it off the shelf or asking for it? And she's like, not really, which is exactly where I am. And so Suburbia, despite being a great game, in fact, they just announced the second edition of Suburbia as well. But I'm, I'm going to be getting rid of my, my collector's edition, which is a little sad because I think it's a solid game. But it's a solid game that no one's asking to play with anymore. And from there, we have Terra Nova. Terra Nova, this coffee situation is not good. I need to keep this coffee nice and friendly over here. There's no more games on the side, so now it's safe. But, and there's actually coffee in it this time. So, we have 
Tussie Musty, which is not what we're talking about. Terra Nova. Terra Nova is a game that I love. This is, I believe, the lowest rated game in my collection in terms of board game geek. But for myself, for myself, it's a game that I genuinely love. The, the aspect of trying to slowly enclose the grid as you pick up these various, uh, tiles or whatever they are. You pick up these little, you pick up your guys and you move your guy and you build a wall. And as you enclose areas, you'll score for those areas based on who has the majority in those areas. And I have always loved Terra Nova. I think it's a great game. And I'm getting rid of it because of Ragnaroks. Ragnaroks, which I just played and reviewed with Mina this weekend. I don't know if Terra Nova is leaving right away because obviously I have to wait for Ragnaroks. But it, it, I think it's leaving right away. I'm, I don't play it enough that it needs to be kept until I wait for the next one. But I like Terra Nova a lot, but Ragnaroks is simpler, it's cleaner, it misses some things that Terra Nova has. The scoring, the way you score different areas is a little bit more manipulative in Terra Nova. There's a lot of solid things in the puzzle of Terra Nova, but Terra Nova very much is an abstract game, and, and abstract games I find don't hit the table as much because they aren't variable. So what ends up happening is I play the game, get a few games in with whoever I'm playing, my wife, my friend, my whoever, and then we get rid of it, not we get rid of it, then it, then it goes back on the shelf for like a year while we get play, we get and play other games, and then we pull it out eventually because it's fun again. And I find that generally happens. The exceptions, the two exceptions in my collection, are going to be TAC and Santorini. TAC because it's just so amazing that it consistently gets pulled out again and again and again. And Santorini because the powers, the god powers, keep the experience variable. It's constantly mixed up. It's constantly fresh as a game that you are playing. Versus Terra Nova is static. It's one of those games like Tsar, like Yinch, that are on my shelf that I pull out infrequently, play it, and then set it and forget it for quite some time. And so I just don't play Terra Nova enough compared to what Ragnarok is going to bring to the table because Ragnarok is going to bring the core gameplay to the table, different, but giving me those same tones, that same feeling of moving a person, building a wall, moving a person, building a wall as you try to strategically enclose yourself or others in whatever way benefits yourself the most. But it brings god powers to the table. It keeps the experience fresh. It's constantly a new puzzle as you figure out how this god faces off against that god. And so Ragnarok's just strictly fire Terra Nova for me. It's possible I'll regret it and one day get it back because, again, Terra Nova does things that Ragnarok's does not. But overall, I think I'm ready to move on from Terra Nova. And from there, we have Cosmic Colonies. So this is going to be a game that I reviewed around two months ago. Uh, maybe three months ago, I'm not sure exactly when. This is going to be by Floodgate Games, and it's a solid polyomino experience. Let's see if we can get a little back-of-the-box action over there. It's a solid polyomino experience where you are building polyominoes out on your space base to cover or not cover things strategically as you go. Uh, for myself, the Monuments expansion inside of it is a key to the experience. It's absolutely core. I think it's essential to play with the Monuments expansion. It gives you more of a puzzle as you place those tiles around the board to enclose or open up certain areas. Uh, for myself, I said at the time, when I reviewed this game, I said it's staying in my collection, but we'll see. I'm not confident in it long term. And the reason for that is because while I enjoy it, even then, I already realized or knew that for myself, at least, I preferred other polyomino games. I preferred, I don't know, uh, Baron Park. I prefer Project L. I prefer Cottage Garden. I prefer any of the other polyomino games in my collection in terms of what I'm bringing to the table. Uh, Cosmic Colonies does a bunch of things well that I enjoy. But the ultimate puzzle of how you play these cards every round, because you play two cards every round, you take a first action and a second action to either gather pieces or take an ability or whatever it is, and or to sorry, to build or to gather, I think it is. And overall, that puzzle mostly works, but it just it didn't feel as streamlined. I'm not sure if that's the right word. It, something about it didn't click with me as much. I enjoyed it. I liked it. Happy to play it. Didn't love it as quite as much as the others. And at the time, the reason I primarily kept it is because my wife said, Rena said, that she wanted to keep it and she wanted to see, you know, how it hit the table. And it hasn't hit the table and she hasn't requested it. And I asked her if we should or shouldn't keep it. And she's like, yeah, it's good. It's good. But she wasn't really pulling it out or offering the table. Same problem as Suburbia or any of the other games that will regularly leave the collection over time. So Cosmic Colonies is unfortunately leaving. I thought it would stick around for longer. I mean, I did. I was always skeptical of how long term it would be, but it literally has not hit the table once since I did the review, which is not a good sign overall, especially for a lighter uh, family weight game that generally can hit the table a little more frequently. I would say that I tend to be a little bit more cutthroat about family weight games that aren't hitting the table. Just practically speaking, that we play more family weight games than I do hardcore games. Games like Baron Park will hit the table more often than games like Blood Rage, even though I enjoy Blood Rage significantly more. But that's the, the nature of having an occasional game group versus an always present family and shorter and more accessible games versus 
harder and longer and whatever games. So family ga family weight games that don't hit the table at a certain point do start getting that that eye of are you going to last? Are you not going to last? What's going to happen? And speaking of family weight games that aren't going to last, we have Harry Potter Death Eaters Rising. Uh, this is a game by... I should know who this is by. I should recognize something or other. This is by the OP Games. I didn't know who this was by at all. Harry Potter Death Theater Rising. This is going to be one of a series of games around the same core premise. We have Marvel, Thanos Rising. I think we have a Batman, the, the, the Dark Knight Who Laughs or something Rising. And I think there's like a fourth one too. There's a lot of games that are using the same core mechanism of a, a rotating character in the middle of the board. Can we see it on the back? You can kind of see it, not really. A rotating character in the middle of the board who's going to spin and point to different regions and make it harder for you to win. This is a cooperative experience, one that is fun and enjoyable, especially if you like Harry Potter as a theme. It's a solid game with a solid theme, it ties in nicely, and it feels like you're being the characters, utilizing them as allies. All in all works very well together. But it's primarily my collection for my daughter, and she doesn't want to keep it anymore. She'd much rather play Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle Duel, I think it was. Not not Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, but there's a dual version of it, a two-player head-to-head that uses the same core system. I think it's called Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle Duel. I could be mistaken. I know she wants to review it at some point. It's definitely her favorite Harry Potter experience in terms of merging the book series she loves with gameplays and board games and all of that. So overall, that one is staying. Harry Potter Death Eaters Rising, there are other cooperative experiences she and I enjoy more. And so again, I asked, and it's not sticking around. This is going to be the third game on today's list so far that involves me asking others whether the game that is primarily there for them is staying or not. And so far, well, we're zero for three on that. Although technically there's one that did get saved by me asking someone else. So so I guess you only see the ones that are chosen as opposed to the ones that are saved. From there, from there we have, I guess not really a surprise, is going to be Tapestry. Tapestry is a game that I reviewed this month and I said it's moving off my collection. And so in general, those should always be uh, the, the ones that you can accurately predict what is happening with uh, as far as these videos go. Tapestry is going to be by Jamie Stegmaier by Stonemaier Games and it is a solid experience. I did a full review on it and I primarily got it back for the solo mode. I had this years ago and played a few games of it and we, I basically at the time felt it was Ganshun clever but less fun in terms of being longer and having potential balance issues as far as our own perception of whether the game was enjoyable or not in terms of just in terms of the, the the icky feeling you get when someone else is going rapidly past you on the track because their abilities seem better or they drew better cards or alternatively just as problematic of being the person who's accelerating past everyone else and feeling guilty because you think it's because it's your civilization power and not because you're playing better ultimately it ends up being less fun for everyone involved now since then they did issue a bunch of corrections in terms of uh, point balancing factors to give you the average points to line things up. It's not a perfect solution though, because the problem is what they're effectively doing is they're utilizing large degrees of data to aggregate what the score difference is and then assign it to a person. That doesn't introduce balance. The problem is it introduces an average modifier. So if in your game, that civilization happened to give you 50 more points and in my game, it gave you three more points. Well, now when you introduce that modifier, this lack of balance around civ abilities means that one player is getting more points than they should have and one player is still getting less points than they should have. The nature of introducing a point modifying factor as a balance has its limitations in how effective it is. But ultimately that wasn't why I got rid of it. I got it back primarily to play it solo to see if it was a game that I wanted to enjoy solo along with Terraforming Mars, along with Spirit Island, being one of those games that is a Euro-ish style game that I sit down, play for an hour, have a great experience, pack up and move on. Most of my solo experiences are generally going to be smaller, shorter, more accessible experiences or alternatively more or uh, mirror trashy or just combat stuff like Marvel Champions, like um, like any, I don't know, uh, what's the games? Uh, right now I'm playing Wild Ascent or uh, Machina Arcana, any of those dungeon crawler, more combat-y style games. And so I only really have two games that I think of as big, heavy, meaty, and hour-long experiences, and those are Terraforming Mars and Spirit Island. It could be more, I'd have to look at my shelf, but those are the primary ones that fall in that category. And so I was wondering if Tapestry would join them. And Tapestry is good. I prefer it solo. In fact, I generally would recommend it solo. If you are a solo player, I think this is a solid solo experience with a great autonomy, overall a fun experience. And yet one that after multiple plays, I realized was fun, but I'd rather play Terraforming Mars. I'd rather play Spirit Island. This was never a situation in which I'd rather play Tapestry. I was always willing to and able to play Tapestry, but not rushing to do so. And so that's why Tapestry is ultimately leaving my collection. Good game, 
both, I mean, I think both ways. I think both competitively and solo, it's a good game. My preference for it is a solo game, but I just don't have enough solo time to really feel the need to pull this out compared to others. Next up, we're going to have 51st State. 51st State is one that I did not do a review on, and I'm not going to do a review on this one. In fact, many of, many of the games that leave my collection don't see a review, and there's a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's an issue of playing it more. I have to play them more. Uh, 51st State, I didn't play it more. I played it one time, but I also played it one time coming to the table, having previously played both uh, 51st State, the original. That was a game that was in my collection for a very long time when I first got into gaming. Played it a ton and eventually moved on from it. And then I got eventually Empires of the North, which I got twice actually. I got it, played it, didn't like it, moved on from it. Got it back a few years later, thinking maybe I didn't really pick it up on it, whatever. And again, played it, didn't like it, moved on from it. And 51st State, I was like, maybe this is back to the experience I want. And, and it's, it's not. It's, I don't know whether I changed or the game system changed. I think 51st State is excellent. I think Empires of the North is excellent. I think they are not the experiences I am personally looking for. But yet I remember fondly the memories I have from the original 51st State. So I don't know what changed more. My own tastes in gaming as I evolved as a gamer over the years. Or the 51st State core game mechanisms. And this is going to be by, uh, what's it called? By Portal Games. And 51st State, it is bringing this idea to the table that is going to be central to all of the games in this series, to, it's going to be central to 51st State, to Empires of the North, to 51st State Master Set, and then to uh, Imperial Settlers Empires of the North. It's bringing all that have this core mechanism of uh, you have three different card rows and you're getting different cards which represent different buildings. There are instant one-time benefit buildings, there are buildings that give you, a, mm, there are buildings that give you production, and then there's a third row, which is actions. There's actions buildings that give you different actions you can utilize by putting people on or different things, and then convert stuff into stuff. And those are going to be the main game mechanisms, converting stuff into stuff as you pick the right cards that most efficiently let you turn stuff into other stuff, with a little bit of interaction between the other players as you potentially raid their situations. And cards can also be used to utilize as deals, which will slot in, so they're not really buildings. They could be buildings, they could be deals, they could be raided, so you can raid cards from your hand, you can raid your opponent's cards. Lots of cards interaction that didn't to myself feel as rewarding as I'd like and and again I don't know the answer as to I loved 51st State back in the day for a very long time before I eventually moved on for it but ultimately I finally got 51st State to the table and I was like well that just felt exactly like Imperial Settlers Empires not I'm sorry it felt exactly like Imperial Settlers and I just I I had given that game a few plays before I moved on from it and so I I'm moving on from 51st State as well and speaking of which I also decided to move on from Empires of the North without playing this one. After three games in this series that I have not ultimately kept, and with a unfortunately way too large backlog of unplayed games, as I've gotten more into content creation, I just have a larger and larger backlog of games that are piling up, of games that I want to play, both my own stuff that I have acquired in terms of getting games to this, getting, like, I have an interest in games, I want to play games, and so I, I go out and I buy games and I get them and then I want to play them, and then three games show up from publishers and I need to play those in order to hit certain timelines to try to, you know, because I mean, if you get a game from publisher, whether or not it's for Kickstarter, there is a certain pressure, even though you're not being paid, there's a pressure to like, hey, they sent me a game, you gotta review it, you gotta be nice or whatever it is, you don't have to be nice to the game, you have to be nice to the timeline. And so, it is a balance, but ultimately, Empires of the North is a game that I don't feel I am going to give it my attention right now, given my lack of interest in the prior three games. And so I am sadly moving on from this one unplayed, which doesn't happen as frequently in terms of the games I'm getting rid of, but certainly does happen here and there. Which brings us to our last game of the day. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games today. Nine games, not bad. I'm okay with nine games. We are getting rid of Night of the Living Dead. Zombicide Edition. Let's put this up here. Let's move that here. And this is going to be a Zombicide game, which is great that I'm getting rid of a Zombicide game because I have too many Zombicide games, unfortunately. I have Zombicide Black Plague. I have Zombicide Green Horde. I have Zombicide Invader, which I have been saying for a year and a half that I need to get rid of. And yet I, I haven't because I still want to try it all. Uh, versus Night of the Living Dead, as much as I am intrigued by another Zombicide experience, as much as I want to get another Zombicide experience to the table, I've just heard far too many things about Night of the Living Dead that don't make, that make me think it's not a zombicide for me. I believe from what I've heard that this is a zombicide to introduce new players to the genre, which makes sense considering the adaptation of a game system and a mass market title that is uh, IP, so to speak, not mass market, an IP that is going to be like, oh, Night of the Living Dead, I love that movie, what's this game all about? And so it seems they dumbed down the difficulty in this game, it seems they took zombicide and made it easier while giving you many of the core systems, which is great. I'm very happy about that, genuinely. I think it's awesome that we 
frequently try to balance new games that are exciting for us as gamers that we want to dig our teeth into and play and learn and whatever versus games that are on the lighter side that might bring someone else to the table that might be someone who three years from now is sitting across from you playing a game because one day they saw Night of the Living Dead on the shelf at Target or wherever it was and they're like that looks cool let me try that out and the next thing you know they're facing head to head against you in Blood Rage and they're putting down a piece all because they slowly but surely got pulled into gaming over a process, over a time, the same way I was, the same way you were, that at some point or another, we all got pulled into this hobby. And so I'm a big fan of anything that does that for others, even if that makes it not a game for myself. And frankly, I also have Zombicide 2nd Edition on the way, and I have Zombicide Wild, Undead or Alive, the Wild West one that's currently on Kickstarter now. I have all of those coming. So it's not like I'm lacking for more Zombicide, and I'd much rather a Wild West theme than this movie, which I never watched, sadly, and have no affinity to whatsoever. And so that, that is going to be the games leaving the collection in February. Nine different titles, some small, some big, some bigger, I guess. This is probably the biggest one on the table. But ultimately, all games that I think, I don't know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed every single one of these. Just, I enjoyed some more than others, and that's usually the way this, this, this game goes. It's uh, just a question of what ultimately is staying when you have a whole bunch of games that you want to play and not nearly enough time to play them. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the new setup. Uh, this is still going to be my new studio or whatnot, where I basically just shifted. I mean, previously, where I'm pointing over there is my couch, and I'm pivoting around to this setup with a little bit more, like, lights and stuff and overhead camera, which is not relevant to this video because I'm not pulling components out. But it's it's a newer setup, and I, I like not having to move my camera around all the time, which is helpful, but we'll see. It's always an experiment, always something I'm playing with. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., and I hope you have a good one.